Hey, it's time for Tech Talk number 14. God, just rambling on. We got lots of cool stuff to talk about uh, with Mac and a few other things and computers. What else? Ventilation. Yes, we're going to talk fun. about studio ventilation and fun with boxes. Anyway, all that and your questions that you've been asking on the uh, email on VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk right now. From the outer reaches, they came. Bearing the knowledge of what it takes to properly record your voiceover audio. And together, from the center of the VO universe, they bring it to you now. George Widom, the engineer to the VO stars, a Virginia Tech grad with the skills to build, set up, and maintain the professional VO studios of the biggest names in VO today. And you, Dan Leonard, the voiceover home studio master, a professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week, they allow you into their world, making the complex simple, debunking the myths of what it takes to create great sounding audio, answering your questions, showing you the latest and greatest in VO tech, and having a dandy time doing it. Welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk. VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, remote studio connections for everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt, VO2GoGo.com, everything you need to be a successful voiceover artist, J. Michael Collins Demos, when quality matters, and VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to drive from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California. Here are the guys. Hi there, I'm Dan Leonard. I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Shop. or VO BS. Yeah. Tech talk. Yes, we're going to talk tech. Yes. Uh, lots of fascinating things. I've been learning all sorts of cool stuff in the last few weeks because I started futzing around with old radios. And it's not the same technology that we use today because everything is solid state and very digital. And radios right. are very, very analog. But I'm learning about what the tubes did and the capacitors and the resistors and it's actually kind of cool got the old 1942 zenith that we dragged into the studio here now hooked up to alexa who will now play anything it's like you know alexa play benny goodman you know and suddenly we get benny goodman in here she's looking you gotta play it. music that's sort of period to the radio though that's right I'll exactly you know, we're, we're lady gaga coming out of that old low five mono speaker it's kind of odd yeah but it's great to hear <laughs> but it's if I, we were talking about this last time on tech talk that you know it's analog stuff and but if you can understand the basics it helps a whole lot when you come to understanding how your own audio is supposed to work so you know pick up a hobby like that but your voiceover audio shouldn't be a hobby it's a profession mm -hmm. so here's a weird thing bridging the analog to digital gap did you know that um, do you have any vehicles with HD radio in them? I think mine does. Because it'll say, like, it'll have a little HD badge yeah. sometimes. Yeah. On the state. What's crazy is it's sending the analog FM signal and the digital HD signal together on the same frequency at the same time. Right. The digital signal is sort of modulated somewhere that it's not audible. I don't really quite understand all of it. But it's they, they have to actually process the audio for the FM band and the digital band all at the same time back at the station and then get them to be in sync with each other. So when your radio loses that HD signal and it gets weak and then it flips to FM, that the two are in sync with each other. They're, it's actually really freaking complicated it, and they have to do that. Yeah, and, and the thing is, is if you're listening to it in, in, on an analog radio and an, an, an HD radio, they're not in sync. They're, half no, they're a, not exactly on. They might be half a second off. But yeah, we yeah, digress yeah. into 
utter utter nonsense right now. This is tech talk, so yeah. we can well, we, we can act we can geek out a little bit. And yeah. speaking of geeking out, what do you got in your update this week? Not a whole lot. Um, you know, it's dog days of summer, so people aren't really uh there's not a lot of new developments going on in technology. But one thing that did come up thanks to the Pro Tools Expert website, that's pro tools expert.com. Um, that's a place I like to jump to occasionally for news in the in the pro audio world. Of course, there are a lot about Pro Tools, but a lot of what they talk about is relevant to a lot of other things. Um, there's just a little bit of a warning about the newest Mac OS, Catalina, and you'll hear me say it once again. When it comes out soon, probably in the next month or two, don't jump on it, especially this one, and here's why. If you have any older software on your Mac that is 32-bit, it is going to just stop working. And sometimes that's things that may be more obvious and sometimes not so obvious. Those not so obvious things are usually audio plugins. So if you've got some old plugins that you bought a version, thank you. You bought a version and uh, you know, you've had it for years and you haven't bothered upgrading it because why buy a new version if it works? Those are the ones that are gonna catch you off guard and are just not gonna work anymore um, after you upgrade to Catalina. Yeah. So fortunately this uh, when uh, one company made an app for finding those apps on your machine that need to be removed or updated. And it's called Go64, meaning Go64 bit. Um, it's at stclairsoft.com slash Go64. Um, that's St. Clair, S-T-C-L-A-I-R-S-O-F-T.com. Um, they have a checker app, it's free. And it will scan your whole Mac and look for old things that are not going to work on Catalina. I found this interesting because I figured by now, 32-bit stuff was definitely not going to be supported. I thought it was history, but uh, it has been supported all the way through Mojave. So Apple's just decided to draw a line in the sand and say, in order for us to move forward and have faster machines that run better and do more things, we have to eventually stop support of this old stuff. So that's what's happening yeah. in Catalina. Yeah, we, we see this a lot, though. You know, some, when things get incompatible and someone will, you know, will, will write to us about some troubleshooting issue, it's like, this thing stopped working or uh, this, this particular device doesn't work on there anymore. And usually it's because it's a PC. Uh, and, and usually it needs an updated driver or something like that. Uh, it, when things like this happen, you really have to be aware of it and uh, make sure that you keep your drivers updated, especially if you're on, on a PC, but try to keep up to date on what's going to make sure that your professional equipment is going to continue to work. Yeah, just be ready for the upgrade spiral. I tend to call it when you upgrade one thing, it becomes a, a chase to find all the other things that also need to be upgraded. And that, that oftentimes can be related to changing your uh, Mac OS or Windows version. Um, that can sometimes trigger this spiral, of the upgrade spiral, or upgrading a piece of key hardware, like going to a new audio interface or something like that. So just be aware of that and don't jump in with both feet. If you have, if you have literally a single computer that you do with everything or use for everything, not a good idea. Be very cautious. But if you have another computer, it's a secondary machine. Maybe it's just a desktop for or a laptop for, for just day-to-day -day use or business, you know, non-production. Um, then maybe you can dabble and experiment with these new systems. Just keep that in mind. Yeah. We, um, we, we get asked yeah. a lot about, about when, you know, when do I, when should I get a new laptop or, and what, which one should I get? And you and I generally say, well, get a Mac. Uh, what, what do you think is if someone's going to buy a laptop and you know, they don't have to be sophisticated in doing voiceover work and not video editing and things along those lines, what do you think is a, is a good combination of stuff to look for? Whether it's Mac or PC, the, the commonalities are going to be for sure absolutely a solid state drive, SSD. If there's any one thing that has made all of our computers dramatically faster, and, and especially on the long term, 
Um, I'm running a 2011 Mac mini at home with an SSD drive and it still runs really well. It's not super fast on some certain video apps and high heavy duty things, but for day-to-day -day use, it does everything really well. And thanks to the solid state drive, that means there's no hard drive inside spinning with spinning platters. That's 1960s technology and uh, <laughs> solid state drives are far, far faster and more responsive. They boot faster, they launch apps faster. Yeah. So no matter what, make sure it has a solid state drive. I would definitely avoid the, um, uh, what they call the, I want to call it virtual hard drive. That's not what it's called. Uh, can you remember, what's the name of the drive on the Mac that it com it combines? Oh, as, as a fusion drive. A fusion those seem like a really great idea. I mean, they, they, uh, the idea being that things that are neat that you access normally or regularly or all the time are in the SSD, everything else is in the hard drive. In reality, it just doesn't perform that great. And if something goes wrong with that fusion drive, it's very difficult to troubleshoot or fix that thing. And, and you basically have to move a different direction. So. When you buy, say, an iMac, my biggest problem with those is that's the default setting. The default option is a Fusion. So definitely upgrade whatever you get to an SSD. Yeah. Um, then from there, it's eight gigs of RAM. I would say today is the, is the minimum. 16 is definitely way, you know, really nice to have. And then um, from there, you know, it's any CPU that's at least seventh or eighth generation Intel, uh, it's going to be fine. Even an i3 uh, is going to be fine. I like an i5 quad or the new Mac minis, for example, have a six core i5 for about $1,000. I love those. Um, Windows computers, they share all, all the same basic components, you know? So whether you're on Mac or Windows, it should definitely share a lot of those uh, features in common. And yeah. also keep in mind with any new Mac, and increasingly now, most a lot of new Windows laptops, there's no more USB-A ports anymore on these computers. Yeah, that's a that bit of a problem. Wait. That's this plug right here, the one you have a thousand of these in your drawer. They don't have this plug anymore. They all have USB-C. But if you just get yourself a USB-C hub, you can get back all the jacks, plugs, adapters, uh, Ethernet, memory card readers, all the ports that you're used to having, um, you can get in one little adapter for maybe 60 bucks. Yeah. It's not that big a deal. It's just, you know, you gotta buy one more thing to get all those ports back. Right. You know, and keep your, and, and when the mothership calls to update your computer, make sure it updates, you know, for updates for that, that particular OS, you know, if now with Apple going to this new system, uh, what's it called? It's called Catalina. Catalina. Yeah, it's just a, just it, it's just hopping on the ferry and going across to Catalina. Apparently not. Uh, There's sharks in them their waters. Yes, Shark Week, which was on the TV in my mom's house today, most of the day. There literally are some great whites in in Cat next to Catalina between LA and Catalina. Yeah, uh, but yeah, just be careful. Just just tread lightly and uh, take a step back and ask one of us for advice before you you leap to something new. Absolutely. Well, it's time to discuss something that is, you know, we were, we had Paul Strickord on uh, last week and he was talking about how his booth doesn't have any ventilation and ventilation. Now I used to sell solar heating. So I learned a tremendous amount about heating, ventilate, you know, heating, ventilation and, and, and air conditioning HVAC. If you're ever wondering what HVAC stands for. Right. And when you're, when you're dealing with your booth, now, if you're in a, a closet or something like that, it's not that critical unless you totally seal the room because, you know, there are air gaps. And as long as there's air gaps, there will be air exchange and it's not that much of a big deal. But if you're in a really hermetically sealed booth, it becomes an issue and you've got to be able to have some sort of way of moving the air around. If you do a lot of long format stuff, if you're doing, yeah, if you're in there for 30 you, seconds, it's right. It's, it's, if you're opening that door every 15 minutes, like apparently tends to happen here in this office, uh, <laughs> without my intervention. Um, when you open that door, you do exchange the air very rapidly. I mean, you're going to get air exchange very quickly. 
but I'll tell you, the more technology you have in your booth, like I'm sure is the case for Paul, he's got everything in there. His computer monitor, mouse, keyboard, everything is there. He can sit in that booth for hours. That is not a good situation to be in if you don't have ventilation. And it's very easy to just kind of get in the flow and forget, oh, I forgot, I haven't opened the door in a while. And at the end of the day, it's the carbon dioxide that's going to get you, not the lack of, lack of oxygen, it's that carbon dioxide poisoning. <laughs> And uh, you just start feeling, that's that thing where the people say the air is stale in here, yeah. or you start feeling a little loss of focus. Or a headache. Up on you, a headache, a headache. Yeah. If you start getting a headache, it's, it's getting bad. So we need ventilation. So Dan, you've, you've solved this problem numerous ways. Some of them very simple, low-tech solutions. Um, and I think you got one of those examples. So I, yeah, I actually know it's an example of a low tech affordable DIY system. Well, you know, I, it's gone through a couple of, you know, iterations and generations and stuff like that, but this is a normal cardboard box. And what I've done is, well, I actually actually built this box out of a lot of scrap cardboard because I had another one that was the same size that I got from my mother's house. Uh, and then I couldn't, you know, and then I like, oh, I only need one. Then I decided maybe I should build two. Uh, a, a well-known voice actor here in, in Hollywood has a studio that I, that I assisted in building and I built the ventilation system too small. And, and, and it was, it was choking off the air and there wasn't enough air getting in. So what Which I just, was, was it the air getting in or the air getting out? It was, just, there were no, it was a number of things. It was, well, now I'm blocking out your view here. Uh, it was, uh, it was a matter of the, the airflow through this baffle, which I'm going to explain in a second, was too narrow and it was choking off the air. And so it had a very powerful fan, it had a turbo fan in it. And then it, uh, it was drawing out the air. The whole thing was a, the intake was passive because the, 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 the booth itself is airtight. So if you're drawing right. air out at, at a high rate, like say a hundred cubic feet per minute, and the thing is less than a hundred cubic feet big, you're going to be exchanging the air in there every minute or two, which is mm -hmm. more than enough. Yeah. But some people like to have like the feel of cool air on them and they want air conditioning and they want the, they want, you know, the constant the temperature to be constant. And if somebody larger is in there or somebody who sweats a lot or somebody who gives off a lot of body heat because body heat animation, maybe. Oh yeah, absolutely. You're, you're, where you're around. really moving around, it can get pretty hot in the booth pretty quick. So if you're able to replace the air in there quickly, uh, but the problem with moving air quickly is that you need a lot of what we call CFM cubic feet per minute. What is the rating of the fan that is drawing the air out and how fast can it replace, pull the air in from somewhere else. So you have to have at least two vents in the booth, one that's drawing the air out and one that's allowing fresh air to come in. And supply it's supply and return. A, a, absolutely. It's supply and return. So what I what I've been doing is I, I take these boxes because one of the th one of the things that happens when you're drawing air in and and pulling it out is there is noise not so much from the fan but it's the sound of air movement and that's what you have to deal with so i've i've come up with these these boxes you you'll see these things you know some people call it a daw box what it is is it's an intake of air and it goes in here and then there are baffles in here. There's one here and there's one here. So the air goes in and around and then out to the exhaust over here. So, I mean, if, if I, if I talk into this thing, you'll hear that my voice doesn't come through very well. No, but, it doesn't come out the other end really at all. Exactly. Meaning yeah. that I built this thing, right? There is foam in here. This is a great DIY project because I, you know, sometimes I used back in Buffalo when I did it in my studio there, I lined the entire uh, thing with Oralex, which made Eric Smith with Oralex very happy. Uh, but what I found in here, we had some old cushions and there was some very light foam in there along with the heavier foam. And I'm like, I'll bet this stuff absorbs really fast. 
and really well and 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 takes the sound of the airflow out because it's not a hard surface that it's going around. So this thing is actually, ha it has this white stuff in here. It was a lot cheaper and a apparent, let's see. Apparently it works really well because if, if it's, if my voice is muffled, well, that means it's going to make sure that the air is sound, the sound of the air is not going to be, it's the sound of the air flowing through that makes the noise that we hear, you know, that becomes that low resonance uh, that you hear with a fan. The whooshing. Yeah. The whooshing of the air. See, when you're making ventilation, you have a couple of things you're trying to stop. You're trying to stop that whooshing sound, right? That's that high velocity air whooshing through. But you're also trying to stop just noise from outside the room from making its way through that pipe and out the other side. So this right. thing is helping with both of those, you know, in one solution. Right. So yeah, I, is that, you got that white stuff inside? Is that that fiber fill that you find in pillows? That's so, exactly what it is. Yeah. yeah. That's what they use in speaker cabinets too, actually. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, we have a question from the audience. Where do you put that? Where do you put that? Well, that's the next part of this. Oh. This goes on the outside of the booth. This, you know, that you have an intake that goes to this part here, and that goes to a an insulated ventilated tube that goes to the vent. So, and then one end, the there's one on the intake and there's one on the exhaust. And you put the fan on the exhaust part, have separated from here by a couple of feet or maybe far away. So the fan is far away from the booth and, you know, I, I generally install these in attics uh, and then, you know, and then have the air either exhausted back into the room or to the outside, but never into the attic. Because if you exhaust it into the attic, that's when you get mold. So when you go to sell your house and there's suddenly all this green stuff growing on the ceiling, not a good idea. So if you can, black yes, exactly. <laughs> so if you can hook it up to, say, a bathroom ventilation or to the eave or to an actual external exhaust that's a really good idea and i've built two of these because there, there's a lot of airflow in these and then i can separate them out and it, it it gets rid of the noise really easy but uh every everyone has to be custom designed and custom placed you know sometimes people don't want all these tubes hanging out of their booth if you've got a closet and you own the house and you want to build something like this that'll you know it, it this is something you would you would put in the attic and you would have two of them, one for the exhaust and one for the one for the intake. And you can have a fan on either end, uh, you know, because sometimes the draw isn't enough to draw in enough cool air from the room. So that's that's an interesting way to take that. But there's another factor involved here, and that has to do with thermal dynamics that nobody ever thinks about. But because you and I do this, we think about this. What happens to warm air? It rises. It is. So if you've got a vent intaking to the booth from the ceiling, it's just taking in more warm air. If you So where is the cool air? The cool air is at the bottom. So when the air conditioning is on, the cool air will sink to the bottom of the room. So you want to have the vent lower for the intake and higher for the exhaust. And I know there's several booth builders who forget that one. And people complain. That's it's funny you said that. I, and what question just came in from Fred North saying, he says, I have my input vent, the supply, um, at the top of my booth because I like the cool air flowing down on me and the exhaust is near the floor. Would I be more efficient the other way around? I oh, three absolutely. Foot five, three foot by five inch wood box with baffles and four feet of four inch hose with a fan on each one. Um, you know what, Fred, I mean, efficiency is one thing. If it's, if it's doing the job you want it to do and you're staying cool and it's giving the oxygen flow, then it's efficient enough. Would it be more efficient based on what Dan just explained? Obviously the hot air is going to rise. So you draw it from the top and you look, you probably would be more efficient the other way around, but if it's working for you, you know, go for it. Yeah. I mean, we, we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago because you have this idea of hooking in the uh, the intake to an air conditioning system. Yeah, I've got to build that soon, actually. We're doing that soon. Yeah, but the air conditioning always has to be on or you're just going to be drawing warm air from an attic or something like that. So right. 
you know, I mean, but it will work. I mean, people are people are people. They have their 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 things, and if they want cool air blowing on them, that's one way to accomplish that, I guess. Yeah, we 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 have to have a a, a Y or like a T and a valve. So like when the air conditioning is not blowing cool air, <laughs> it will shut off the supply from the air conditioning, and you'll start drawing air from the from the room instead. So that he's not getting choked off or worse, hot air right. when the heat is on. Because the heat might be on, but you may not want that in the booth. No, it's not in a small not booth. A simple thing. All right. So that is our discussion on ventilation, folks. <laughs> Take it or leave it. If you got yeah. more questions on this, well, we can answer that. Make sure you write to us at the guys at VOBS. But we got lots of questions from our amazing audience out there so let's take a break and we'll get to those right after those oh i think i heard the voice of a body shop i did i did hear the voice of a body shop Beat old body shop well hello there i bet you weren't expecting to hear some big voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for snapchat were you this is virgin radio well okay we're not that innocent there's jeans for wearing and there's jeans for working. Dickies, cause I ain't here to look pretty. She's a champion of progressive values, a leader for California, and a voice for America. It's smart. It's a phone. It's a smartphone. But it's so much more. It's a, the files are ready. Don't forget to pick up the eggs. What time is hockey practice? Check out this song. It's the end of the road for Rick. Oh, it's just you and me, Rick. When hope is lost. The I-8 from BMW. Who said saving the planet couldn't be stylish? Hey, it's J. Michael Collins. Bet you think I'm going to try and sell you a demo now, huh? I think they speak for themselves. But I will give you my email. It's jmichael at jmcvoiceover.com. Now, if Dan will stop waxing his mustache for a minute, we'll get back to the show. VoiceOverEssentials.com just put their VO1A microphone on sale for a limited time. $20 off the regular price of $299. Now, here are some of the most recent quotes they've gotten on the VO1A from the War Room Studio. We've been saying the VO1A is a really great quality mic for the dollar. Since 2011, we've been using it in our broadcast studio for eight years, and we're still it still hasn't let us down. They just work and sound good. This is a great mic. From Mansoor Reyes. Thanks for this. Finally, a Harlan Hogan VO1A review. Based on my cans, that is a great sounding mic. From Richard Hall. I recently bought the VO1A and love it too. Amazing mic for the money. Here's another one. Hey, it's my mic. I own the VO1A and I've gotten hundreds of jobs over the years with it. I'm adding a 416 soon, but honestly, I think there'll always be a place for the VO1A in my arsenal. I can't tell you how many compliments I've received from top industry pros over the years regarding the sound. Also, take whatever you want from the VO1A's webpage, and here's the address right here. Mention that there are over 50 additional quotes from delighted customers at the bottom of the page. Hmm, including one from me. And, of course, mention it's the voiceover microphone. Yay! Okay, now you can unmute it. Hey, that's me. It's time to talk about Source Elements. There's those clever creators of Source Connect, and Source Connect is the tool you're probably going to be seeing more often from more agents and voiceover clients at the highest level than any other technology. So you want to be ready to go when that happens. And the best way to do that is just to go over to source-elements.com, sign up for a 15-day free trial, get your iLock account all set up. Don't bother buying an iLock key. You don't really need that right now. Just get it up and running. Go through the little, the few hoops to get it up and running and running smoothly. And that way the day comes, you get that gig, you can start your license. You can then pay for it on a monthly, or you can just buy it outright and own it. It's up to you. That's Source Connect, the best way and the most professional way to connect your studio to other studios around the world as a voice actor. We'll be right back with more Tech Talk here in just a second. This is Bill Ratner, and you're enjoying Voice Over Body Shop with Dan Leonard and George Whittem. VOBS.TV.
And we're back here on VoiceOver Body Shop. And uh, interesting discussion about ventilation. We've got lots of great questions coming up from people who send them in. If you've got a question for us, again, you can throw it in the chat room uh, at, uh, you know, there's the chat room in Facebook. There's the chat room that we have uh, accompanying our, our regular webpage at VOBS.TV. We like to hear from you. But you can also write to us at the guys at VOBS. Dot TV, and that makes it easy because then I'm like, I get the questions, and we're like, well, we'll just ask the questions, and we'll get to that in a second. But there's one thing that George and I, this is the most important thing about this show, and that is utter, complete, shameless promotion. That's why we're here doing voiceover body shop, especially tech talk, because one, you guys love hearing all this tech stuff, but we're also here to let you know that we're here to help you professionally with your home voiceover studio. Uh, it's a unique environment. There are very specific rules that, that you really have to adhere to, and it's got to sound a certain way. And there's only two human beings on the face of this planet, even though we're not from this planet, uh, who, uh, who know more about how this all works and what it's supposed to sound like, and that is Mr. Whittem and myself, I say humbly, and George, if they want to talk to you and get some of your services, where do they go? You can head on over to georgethe.tech or georgethetech.com. They both work amazingly. Technology ain't a great. Um, you can find all my different services over there. You can schedule me. Uh, you can send me sound for sound checks. You can have me design a whole studio. And you can even bring me out. There's a bring George out option in the service page to get me booked to any place in the world with the help of your friends to divide up the cost. So check that out. It's a new thing I've started offering. And Dan, how do they get a hold of you? Well, they over just go, yeah, homevoiceoverstudio.com. It's over here. There we go. Uh, yeah, uh, go over there, read about what, you know, how I teach you and how I consult and how I'll start. If you've never built a home studio before, you're probably terribly intimidated by it. I'll, I'll take that boulder off your shoulders and, and help you make it sound easy because it actually is easy. It's just that every studio is unique and we have to really look at what your situation is, where you want to record your sound. Do you want a booth? Do you have a closet? You know, where is it you're going to do it? We'll find the best place and I'll sniff it out as I like to say, and uh, literally I will go through someone's house going, okay. And, and like talking and sounds bouncing off the pe people who work with me, they'll say, that's actually what he did. And uh, I'll find the best place for you to record and we'll make it sound proper. And, uh, and that's really important because again, it's got to sound the way it's supposed to sound. And uh, so Talk to us. We're the guys that can make that happen. Go over to homevoiceoverstudio.com. And I've got my uh, my specimen collection cup there. If you've got audio, if you built a studio and you want to hear, if you're getting your sound right, you can click on that, and that will take you to a Dropbox where you can give me some raw audio, follow the instructions to a T on how I want that audio sent, and uh, I'll get right back to you. Hopefully, I usually do. Uh, but I also do house calls. i got to go to Glendale tomorrow. Help somebody with their with their booth. So that's going to be across town. It's just get on the one on one. Boom. If you're in the greater LA area, I can I can you know bring my wrench and I can you know help you out. If you got a problem, also uh, give us a buzz as well. So is that the one on one east or the one on one south? East. It's actually the one on one south, but it goes to the one for thirty four east, right? <laughs> Exactly. It's yeah, so right. freaking confusing. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. Um, it's anyway, California. Had an additional note about his ventilation we mentioned earlier. So it's bringing the cold air in and, and pushing it out from the roof of the booth, but its source for that is from the floor outside. So he has it ducting and sucking there from way down below at the floor level. So that's where the cool air is outside. That's where he's bringing it in and then forcing it into the top. A little bit more complicated, but again, it's doing what he wants it to do. Yes. All right. Well, thanks for letting us know, Fred. Appreciate that. We have a question uh, sent in to us from Jane Irolo. I had a couple of questions. She goes, I have a small space in a trailer for a sound studio. We've heard that one before. The noise floor seems okay. Would a porta booth be a good idea for a small space? The porta booth becomes the permanent sound studio. 
Uh, well, can it can be. Uh, I th- I think for traveling, the, the Porta Booth, which you can get at voiceoveressentials.com, uh, is, uh, it's, it's, it's great for on the road. And I think in a small thing like a trailer, it might actually be kind of effective. What do you think? I think it would help. I mean, uh, those booths are really good when you use them in conjunction with some other practical things. So in a small space like a trailer, if you've got uh, some drapery hanging up between the front and the back, or you have at least something else in there that's soft, the porta booth will work really well with that. Um, being aware that, you know, you're still going to have to park that trailer in a quiet location. Um, you're not going to want to be parked near a freeway or in a crowded KOA campground with tons of families running around. Peru. That doesn't work that well. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're in a quiet location, it could, it could actually work out pretty well. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a minor commitment compared yeah. to what some people do in their trailers. Yeah, we've, we've, we've known people that, you know, who is it that's, that travels around and she lives in her trailer and she's doing voiceover? Oh. We had on, uh, forgive me for not, was it, was it a Kendra? Something like that, yeah. It was a while ago, but. I can't remember her name, but she's been on the show, but yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Also, taking a, she's taking an Audacity course. The takeaway is if you reach a noise floor of at least 46 on the scale, Scale. You can get the noise floor below 59 by applying noise reduction twice. I have heard various opinions in this method's usefulness. What is your opinion? Well, we that's have opinions Greg. about that. Yeah, that's from Greg <laughs> Sutton. That's not from Jane. No, that's um, no, that was that was actually from Jane. Oh, okay. It's yeah. a, thanks. Okay, yeah, got it. Greg, from, got thanks, it. Jane. Um, the, the problem with these rules of thumb is they're all completely dependent on the kind of noise. And the frequency content of that noise. Is it rumble? Is it broadband? Is it a hum or a buzz? That You can't just go by numbers and just expect to get a great result. Yeah. It just doesn't work. I've seen noise floors at minus 20, minus 33, that's all rumble. And by using a high pass filter, I can drop it to minus 60. Um, you know, so it just depends. Noise reduction is really a band-aid it really is the last thing i want to do is apply any kind of noise reduction algorithm to my audio unless it's unless i have no other choice doing it twice again is it being a pro is it being applied properly to what degree um you know i don't i won't give advice on something i haven't heard yet so i really i really can't say that that method is is a surefire solution yeah i'm not i'm also not saying it's not, it's not saying it's wrong either. Right. Well, it, it depends, you know, who is the end user and how much do they care about that sound? I, I have found, especially with something like Audacity, if you use their noise reduction strategies, or the, the filters that they have in there, you've got to be extremely precise and you have to know how to be able to remove that sound without it distorting your audio or leaving digital artifacts and those yep. sorts of things. And and that's a real skill, and that's something you learn over time. My philosophy is generally do everything you can physically to get rid of that noise. And as you were saying, if you do have noise, what is that noise? What frequency is it at? And work, try and find the source of the noise and eliminate it as opposed to relying on noise reduction strategies. Uh, and we've talked about this before. And the fact is, is these things were not designed for single track mono voiceover tracks. Uh, they were designed for more complicated tracks where, you know, an interview in a loud environment or uh, somewhere where, you know, someone is talking and there's noise in the back. You've got to be able to remove that. But you're recording in an incredibly quiet space. Why apply a sledgehammer? to really what you really need is just a little bit of sandpaper. So yeah. Uh, it's- Yeah, I mean, don't just, don't just, you know, arbitrarily or compulsorily, compulsor, rarely. I think I made up- By default, word. yeah, go for it. Yeah, don't just <laughs> add noise reduction to everything and don't just, you know, boy, noise reduction. It, it's, it's not the right fix for every kind of noise. Noise is not noise, it's not noise. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. as you said, you know, with a low, a low rumble, it may be inaudible, but it might be rumbling at minus 30. 
And yeah. just by getting it, I mean, it's, but it's there and some engineer is going to see it if he's not looking at a spectrogram of it. And he's got there's there's a lot of background noise there, but it's easy to remove because it's below the vol. It's below the frequency of your actual voice. Right. So by just totally tuning that out, it'll, it can get rid of that. All right. This is from Greg Sutton. Hey, fellas, love the show. Keep up the great work. I uh, currently have a Scarlet Solo first gen. Ah. And apart from driver issues here and there, must be on Windows, <laughs> um, it's worked perfectly fine for me the past few years. However, I'm looking to upgrade to mic, upgrade to two mic inputs and a bit more functionality for future projects. I'm okay with investing in something longer term at this point, and I've heard amazing things about Audient and the Universal Audio Apollo. Or should I just simply get the Gen 3 to i2 and call it a day? I currently use a Dell XPS or Windows 10, Reaper, and a V01A, the Harlan Hogan mic. Excellent. Which has been amazing, by the way, but am also purchasing a 416 to add to the arsenal. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I haven't heard the Gen 3 yet, but if it's mo if no one focused right, each one gets better. Yeah. Uh, and the Gen 3 has this air mode on the preamp, which again, I haven't played with, but it's based on venerable, very well-respected technology. Um, so why would you spend more than a Gen 3 to 2i2 and buy the Audient or the UAD Apollo or the UA Apollo? It just, it comes down to features, it's the bells and whistles, you know, the audience has a few more, the, uh, well, depending on which audience you're talking about, the ID 20, ID 22, I'm thinking of, or the 44, there's more complicated signal routing for doing little extras and loops and all this other crazy stuff. The Gen 3 I2 I2 has a loopback feature in it now. That's so great. not going to miss that feature that much for doing playbacks to the client. Um, the Apollo, whole nother can of worms in terms of functionality really complex a lot of horsepower is it does it matter to most voice actors no because you're going to do all that processing in your software anyway when you're doing an audition or something so you don't need all that front-end processing so i would say you're going to be served fine with the gen 3 2i2 really be yeah. surprised if you weren't yeah, I mean, it's uh, and we know they make great products. There have been little compatibility issues here and there, but usually they're easy to solve once you understand what you know what's causing it. Sometimes it always comes down to OS updates. Yeah, it usually updates. is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I you know I like the two i two. I've been you know I've been using. I'm on a second gen now, and I'm going to get a third gen probably. Uh, third gen's worth it just for that loopback thing alone. Yeah. I think. Of course, these red boxes are going to start piling up in here, but uh, you know, because we we use the we use the first gen. Well, that's a second two second gens we've got in here, but uh, uh, you know, an interface is an interface is an interface, and as you said, it comes down to features. If you're not competent or really understand what something does, don't use it, and you don't need it. Because essentially you're using two tin cans and a string and the string is your interface and you don't want, you know, you don't want to be paying cat, crats, cat's cradle with it in the middle. How's that for a metaphor? Oh, my God. Well, yeah. And if you do get an Apollo, you're going to have to get advice or help with some from somebody. I've set them up yeah. for a ton of people. It is uh, a little heavy lifting to get it doing what you want it to do once it's doing it it does it but it's it's not hard, not easy to set up yeah so try gen 3 and report back yeah exactly and if it sucks for you then well then we'll we'll know Take gen 3 and then go to georgethetech.com in the morning right or home voice right. studio.com uh the lovely and talented debbie Irwin has a question for us she says howdy just arrived and so it so happens i'm in the market for a new setup for my studio bricks booth in the country so Mac Mini is the recommendation, always for us. She just arrived somewhere. She said, I don't know where she arrived, but apparently she's Pro in the country. Some, someplace up in the Catskills to escape the heat of the city. Very smart. You know, um, yeah, uh, I'm, Dan and I are clearly fans of Mac Minis. We've both been using them over the years for a very long time. Um, I, like, I like that the computer brain and the display are two separate things. I know it's old-fashioned, but... Um, if the screen goes crazy, no biggie, buy another $150 screen, plug it in. Uh, if the computer goes down or dies or you upgrade, 
if you got a real fancy screen, plug in your new computer. Um, you know, it's it's much easier to fix them. Um, and as I've said a thousand times, any Mac that you buy that's been made in the last five, six years is going to be perfectly adequate for voiceover. A Mac mini comes by default with the all important solid state drive. That's the only way you can get it now, the 2018 Mac mini. So you can't screw that up. Even the 799 base model is freaking great. It's fast, it's smooth, it's quiet. So And that's all you I, need. I, I, right. And yeah. you, can, you, can, you don't have to get an expensive screen for it either. I mean, the regular flat screen will work fine with it. So that's cool. Yeah. And and then she Deb goes on to ask, says, any current deals out there on the four, on a 416, a Sennheiser 416? I need to buy a second one to match my New York City setup. Ah, uh, so she's not really moving. She's got a country home. She has a country home. Yes. Okay. Well, getting the match is more than just the mic, as you probably know, but having the same mic certainly helps. Um, if the two booths are totally different sizes or different environments, you know, it's a little more, more tricky to get them to match. Um, in terms of second, uh, a second mic of second 416, there, uh, I know it's Joe Cipriano's had these coupon code deals and stuff <laughs> with DSW from time to time. Go Googling around, asking around, poking around Facebook for, with your friends, see what they know. Um, but I don't have any current hot lines to a deal on a 416. Um, if you find one for under $800 from a reputable retailer, then that's a killer deal. If you find one for under $800 on eBay, uh, probably run away. There's a lot of, a lot of counterfeits of that microphone. Yeah. Do I, not buy a surprisingly inexpensive 416 yeah. uh, that's new. I, I have a surprisingly simple suggestion for, for Ms. Irwin. It comes in a really nice case. The 416 was designed to be a road warrior. It is a heavy-duty microphone. It comes in that really nice case that totally protects it. It is your microphone, your voice. It is what your, you know, the setup you have in New York is going to be this if you have the same mic upstate and the exact same mic you're going to be doing yourself a lot of favors i know you don't like to travel with the mic but a 416 is a lot easier to travel with than say a neumann tlm 103 or, sure. or a tlm 49 uh yeah. you know something really expensive it's a thousand dollar mic but it travels really well it was really built to to hammer nails and still sound fabulous so yeah i would say until you can find that deal you know, it goes in the suitcase with everything else. My close proximity at a very good price would be the NTG4 that's made by Rode. Yeah. Uh, not exact clone, but pretty similar based on tests I've done on our show. I Another show, the Pro Audio Suite podcast that I host, we did a shootout of the 416 against these other mics and the, and the NTG4 did well. Actually, the Rode NT1 sounded crazy similar to the 416. We were shocked. And that's under three hundred dollars, so you could at least have a stunt mic if you're, uh, you know, need a backup if you're worried about something getting lost or damaged in transit. So, Absolutely. All righty. Well, who said we can't fill an hour with this geeky stuff? Holy cow, we sure did. You Sorry, were... Stu. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you gonna do? All right. Well, we're gonna wrap things up right after these important messages. Hey guys, this is Tom, also known as the voice of SpongeBob SquarePants, and you want to fill your ear holes and your eye holes with Dan and George and the Audio Body Shop. Meow, ah! snails like it too. Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. Now there's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. Voiceover Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, and industry insiders when you join the online sessions bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, casting, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, 
performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports and get 14 bonus reports on how to ace the voiceover audition. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. As a voice talent, you have to have a website. But what a hassle getting someone to do it for you. And when they finally do, they break or don't look right on mobile devices. They're not built for marketing. For the last decade or so, the name VO to GoGo has become synonymous with up to the moment expert award winning training in voiceover performance, business building, and mindset. But it's also been a name that requires some explanations. Sometimes a repeat calling out the numeral two. Well, it's time for a change. It's time for a simpler, more direct, and easy to spell name for their company and their training. One that embodies the mission they have to train voiceover talent in the art, the commerce, the science, and the mindset of voiceover. To help make VO 2 go, go clients superheroes to their clients. Within the next few weeks, they'll say goodbye to VO2GoGo.com and they'll say hello to something new and deep and intelligent and fun. The new name will represent all the familiar knowledge and content David and his team have been giving you for the last 12 years, plus a whole lot more. And it'll be a lot easier to spell and to type into your browser. Stay tuned. Before time began, there was VOBS.TV. Watch or else. And we are back to say goodbye, but don't go anywhere quite yet because we've got a few things to tell you. Like, uh, next week we'll have a special guest. Who that special guest is, it'll be a surprise. It's always a surprise. Got a lot of great people coming up, though. Uh, people are lining up. They're like, they're lining outside our door because they want to be on our show. Anyway, who are our donors of the week? Donors of the week. We had coming across the bow Ryan Lelick. Tom Pinto, Trey Mosley, Pearl Hewitt, George Whittem Sr. That's my dad. Yes. This is his office. Uh, Patty Gibbons, Diana Birdsall, and Uncle Roy's Antland Productions. All Thanks right. to hey. all of you who donated. Absolutely. And show us your booths, guys. I mean, we had to resort to using, you know, George Sr.'s office here tonight. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, but, you know. <laughs> We tried to match it up. It, it didn't quite work that way, but anyway. It's basically impossible. We, yeah. we, we, we tried. We tried to match the backdrops. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, you going to do? We're uh, yeah, sending to us either portrait or not portrait, landscape. Either not portrait not or Not portrait, landscape. only landscape. And that's and yeah. that's how you'll do that. Um, and send them to uh, the guys at vobs.tv. Uh, again, if you want to work with George, where do you go? GeorgeTheTech.com and Dan's over at HomeVoiceOverStudio.com. That's where That's right. you'll find us. Uh, hey, you know we're here every. We, you know we're here all the time. It seems like we never leave the booth. But uh, you'll you'll you know we're watching Tech Talk next week. We'll have a we'll have another live guest, and then we'll have Tech Talk 15. Boy, it's amazing. It, time is just rambling on. And if you want to be in our studio, like the lovely Mrs. Leonard is right now. Yes, yeah, show 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 Mrs. Len. No, no, no. We we have to show her in this. Never mind. Okay. If you want to be in the audience, all you have to do is write again. Write to us at the guys at vobs.tv if you happen to be in the greater Los Angeles area, uh, and we'd be glad to have you here because it's fun to watch the show live. Uh, again, the guys at vobs.tv. Well. We need to thank our amazing sponsors, uh, Harlan Hogan's Voiceover Essentials. Voiceover Extra. Source Elements. VO2 Go Go. For the time being. VoiceActorWebsites.com and. NJ Michael Collins Demos. Yes. Also, the Dan and Marcy Leonard Foundation for the Betterment of Live Webcasting. And, of course, our technical director, who did a magnificent job once again, Sue Merlino. And, uh, and of course, Lee Penny for being Lee Penny. 
anyway. And lastly, my Widom family for letting me for putting up with do you. the show and take over <laughs> the office for the evening. All right. And for all, and actually for all my relatives who got off the Wi-Fi tonight to make sure I would have my live one. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. All righty. Well, that's going to do it for us. You know, not an easy business voiceover, but you got to have a home studio. And if you have a home studio, it's got to sound the way it's supposed to sound. And that's why we're here at VoiceOver Body Shop, to make sure that you get it sounding right. Anyway, that's going to do it for us. I'm Dan Leonard. I'm George Whittem, and, and somebody's... Come in here, Ella, and say your name. I'm Dan Leonard, George Whittem, and... Ella, Ella Whittem. There you go. Right. And this is voiceover... Body Shop. Or VO... B-S. Slight oh, delay in there. All right. We'll see you next time, guys. Thanks for coming.